During the summer of 1994, a young girl was reunited with her mother after being separated for a long period of time. But only four months later, the girl's body would be found buried in a vacant lot near a shopping center. This is the despicable case of Pauline and John Zyle. Hello, friend, and welcome to High Time Crime. My name's Joel, and on here I specialize in true crime and also impulsively buying random things on the internet. What do I need this for again? You tell me. But anyway, today's video is about the case of Pauline and John Zyle. You're going to learn about a mother and a stepfather who did something so vile and so despicable that frankly, it's a little hard to talk about. For our story, we're heading to Palm Beach County, Florida. Palm Beach County is a location pretty similar to the typical idea of Florida with its white sandy beaches and great weather. The county is situated in the southern part of the state with a long coastline that stretches all the way from Boca Raton to the town of Jupiter. If you ever find yourself in this warm, tropical area, there's definitely no shortage of things to do. You can visit the Palm Beach Zoo and Conservation Society and become a first-hand witness to a bunch of exotic animals. You could go to the Gumbo Limbo Nature Center where traversing through relaxing natural scenery is the entire purpose. You could head over to the Juno Beach Pier and build a couple sandcastles on the beach below. You could even wade through Jim Abernethy's scuba adventures where, as long as you're careful, you'll be able to swim around a group of sharks. But unfortunately, as fun as all of those activities sound, none of them are the reason why we're in Palm Beach County today. Pauline Zyle was born on June 13th of 1970 in Maryland. Her given name was originally Pauline Yingling before later getting married. While not much is known about her early childhood, there are a few key details that are definitely pretty clear. First of all, her mother's name was Paula Yingling and her father was either absent or not exactly close to her. She had one brother named John who grew up to be a firefighter and an emergency technician. Overall, her childhood appeared to be pretty rough. As a teenager, Pauline and her family moved from one run-down apartment to the next. They really had a hard time finding anywhere to permanently live. At the age of 16, while in 10th grade, Pauline became pregnant by a boy she was dating named Frank Halt. Pretty soon, this led to her dropping out of school and missing out on an education. A few months after this, her and Frank ended up getting married. Then on May 23rd of 1987, Pauline and Frank gave birth to a little girl that they named Christina Diane Holt. However, only a year later, Pauline and Frank's relationship quickly broke down. On June 14th of 1988, one day after Pauline's birthday, the couple officially got divorced. Now, despite initially acting like he would consider taking custody of their child, from this point forward, Frank Holt never lived with his infant daughter, Christina, ever again. But according to divorce papers, he didn't think Pauline was an appropriate parent either. In fact, he described his now ex-wife as being an unfit mother and a potential flight risk. Which, to be honest with you, didn't turn out to be that far from the truth. Around the same time as the couple's divorce, Pauline was taking a lot of illegal substances and alcohol and cycling through a series of different low-paying restaurant jobs. And basically, just as Frank anticipated, Pauline was a flight risk from her own child. Pretty soon, the young mother began looking for a way out of taking care of her daughter. Her solution was to send Christina away to live with her paternal step-great-grandmother. Now, Try saying that five times fast, huh? But anyway, this paternal step-great-grandmother was a woman by the name of Dorothy Money. Dorothy was over 65 years old and suffered from severe arthritis. Despite this, for over five years, the baby Christina grew up and lived in a relatively comfortable middle-class neighborhood in Maryland. And really, these were the best years of her life. 
According to those that knew her, such as neighbors and friends, Christina was kind, sweet, and very outgoing. And she did see her mother Pauline about once a year around the holidays, but these visits were oftentimes pretty brief and awkward considering the situation. However, at the very least, Christina was able to have a pleasant early childhood living with Dorothy. Meanwhile, by this point, Christina's mother Pauline had relocated to Florida and was doing some more growing up herself. At age 19, Pauline had already gotten married again, this time to a man by the name of John Zyle. Now, similarly to Pauline, John Zyle was an alcoholic and came from the state of Maryland. In addition, he was a lowlife and a degenerate criminal. It wasn't long before Pauline and John had two children together, both of whom were boys. But putting it gently, the father of these two boys had a really nasty history and a long rap sheet. To give you a brief summary, John Zyle was born in the year 1963 in Maryland. From a young age, John already demonstrated signs of being a career criminal. According to records, he spent much of his youth incarcerated, bouncing from one involuntary group shelter to the next. And his highest level of education was ninth grade. But even in school, he suffered from severe behavioral problems and was once suspended for being too rowdy. Throughout his young adulthood, John Zyle lived in a series of different residences. He was never able to keep or hold down a job. This was despite trying out practically everything, all the way from restaurants to painting cars and doing drywall. On top of this, he had severe substance abuse issues, as we mentioned earlier. But in 1984, John soon got hit with a pretty serious charge after he broke into a few homes and stole a bunch of items. This included things such as silverware and a rifle. Eventually, for this crime, he was given a five-year sentence. It was then, towards the end of the sentence, while he was still on probation in Maryland, that he violated probation by moving to Florida. Here in Florida, he then met Pauline, and pretty shortly after, the two of them started dating. John was forced to return back to Maryland for a bit in order to face the charge of violating probation. While he was there, Pauline sent a bunch of letters to the judge pleading for John's release and describing him as a terrific guy and a hard worker. She also said that she was having trouble paying the bills without him, even though she was now working two jobs. Ultimately, after a few months in jail, John returned to Florida and him and Pauline were able to continue their romance. Afterwards, they then had the two boys. And actually, it would have been three in total, but on the third, John forced Pauline to terminate the pregnancy. Despite this, Pauline and John Zyle raised the two boys together for the next several years under really bad living conditions. In fact, the family struggled so badly financially that for a while they found themselves forced to live in different motel rooms that they rented on a week-to-week -week basis. And in addition, a neighbor reported that at one point, Pauline started going door-to-door -door trying to sell the children's favorite videotapes in order to pay for gas money. At the same time as all of this, the married couple still maintained a bad substance abuse and alcohol habit. So the little money they made from Pauline being a waitress and John being a cook at the same restaurant, they could hardly afford to cover the cost of living. Eventually, the family was able to pull enough money together to settle down in an apartment complex in a town in Palm Beach County known as Rivera Beach. But even here, the landlord reported that there was a considerable degree of instability within the small family. Evidently, John and Pauline fought constantly, and John began drifting from job to job and quitting without notifying his employers. Meanwhile, Pauline still worked her two jobs at different restaurants, and because she was so tired and stressed out towards the end of her shifts, she oftentimes wanted to go out and have a few drinks. However, John never tolerated this, and so he was frequently calling her and asking her where she was, and demanding that she return home to watch the kids. Even under all these circumstances, John always paid the landlord on time. With the only other apparent issues being that the couple's home was extremely messy, and the fact that John liked to blast his music really loud at night. Overall, the family was just really reclusive, and for unknown reasons, John disappeared every now and again for days at a time 
without informing his wife. Now, as for the way the couple treated the children, it really wasn't vastly different from the way they treated practically everything else. Badly. By now, the two boys were age two and four, and yet Pauline refused to allow them to go outside and play or hang out with any other kids. Anytime they received a birthday invitation or a request for a play date, it was immediately declined. In addition, neighbors reported seeing the children constantly opening up the blinds of the windows and banging on them and trying to get the attention of the people down below. But as if the couple didn't already have enough on their plate, pretty soon they were about to get a new addition to their disgruntled family. Someone that they would look for any way to get rid of, even if it meant cold-blooded murder. So by this point, the year was now 1994, and Pauline's daughter Christina had grown up to be seven years old. As I'm sure you remember, not long after her birth, she was sent to live with an elderly relative named Dorothy Money. At this point, Dorothy was getting pretty old, and her arthritis had reached a point where she was hardly able to walk, nonetheless take care of a child. Therefore, in 1992, Dorothy effectively retired from taking care of Christina and sent her to live with her paternal grandmother, Judy Holt, who only lived a block up the road. Judy Holt was Dorothy's adopted daughter, and for the next 22 months, she became the new caretaker of the child. However, Christina still went and hung out with Dorothy on the weekends, and her bedroom was preserved just the way it was when she still lived there. Before long, though, Judy Holt grew tired of taking care of Christina. She figured it would be better if Christina was taken care of by her actual mother. And little did she know what a terrible idea this was. But even so, in the summer of 1994, she made the decision to send Christina away to Florida in order to live with Pauline, John, and their two children. Meanwhile, Christina's former caretaker, Dorothy Money, was left completely in the dark about this decision, and the moment she figured out what happened, she immediately cut off all contact with her adopted daughter, Judy. In addition, Dorothy didn't have access to Pauline's phone number, and so from here on, she never spoke to either Pauline or Christina again, but someone else who was kept in the dark about the decision to send Christina to live with her parents was actually Pauline herself. Despite the fact that Pauline showed all of her colleagues at work pictures of her daughter and always talked to them about how well she was doing at school, when Judy Holt drove the seven-year-old Christina to Florida to return her to her mother, it came as a complete and total surprise to Pauline. Regardless, because Christina was Pauline's daughter, Pauline took her in. And sadly, only four months later, the little girl would wind up dead. But for now, Christina and her mother were excited to be reunited at last. Up to this point, the two of them had only talked to each other on holidays and through postcards. The truth is, they didn't really know each other very well despite being mother and daughter. But even as little as they knew each other, to Christina, her stepfather John was practically a complete and total stranger. And unfortunately for Christina, she was never afforded the opportunity to stay away from this stranger. This was because he was living in the same one-bedroom apartment and being her quote-unquote caretaker, a word that isn't even remotely relevant to how this despicable man treated her. During the following few months, as the family was getting acquainted with each other and Christina was being enrolled in elementary school, John quickly became physically abusive to his stepdaughter. Pretty soon, this became an ongoing theme. Now, while most of the information about what was happening was and is only available to Christina and her two boys, it's not as if John made what he was doing to Christina that much of a secret. One anecdote that's an extremely disturbing example of things to come comes from a family friend by the name of Chad Brannon. So evidently, one day when Chad was visiting the family at their apartment, he witnessed John Zyle beating Christina so badly that he gave her bruises on her bottom. And then, when he was done, he showed these bruises off to Chad, almost as if he was proud of what he had did. This wasn't even close to the first time that John had done something like this to Christina. In fact, by the time September rolled around, 
She had even started missing school because of it. Overall, Christina missed 17 out of only 22 days of school as a result of John's attempts to hide her various injuries from the public. And so this was absolutely terrible. But one important point to emphasize is Christina's mother Pauline's role in all of this. Now, while Pauline didn't beat her daughter herself, it's not as if she was just some innocent bystander. In fact, she was more than responsible for condoning it, watching it happen, not doing anything about it, and as you'll soon figure out, a cruel and despicable cover-up operation once this abuse had reached its inevitable conclusion. But before we get into that, let's talk about the disappearance of Christina Halt and the events that followed. So in October of 1994, Pauline Zeil went on television claiming that her daughter Christina had been kidnapped from the bathroom of a flea market in Fort Lauderdale. And with tears in her eyes, she pleaded for her daughter's safe and swift return. But one thing that was strange about it was that she kept referring to her daughter in the past tense as opposed to the present. For example, she'd say things like, she was a nice girl and she loved her family. And overall, it was just sort of weird because it's like, if you don't know the location of your daughter, why would you assume she's dead? Regardless, she had already set up and planned a lot of this out. And so after investigators and the local police became involved, Pauline quickly fabricated a perfect story for what happened the day her daughter disappeared. First, she led them to her car, where she had placed a half-empty juice box and a bag of candy in the back seat. And then, alongside this, she told investigators that when her and Christina went to the flea market, they were planning on spending a day at the beach and then going to the circus later, with the flea market being just a temporary stop on the way. She claimed that Christina was really excited to go to the circus and ride all the rides and have fun. But of course, all of this was just a bunch of nonsense. Following Pauline's interview with police, the authorities then continued their investigation into her daughter's missing persons report, and along the way, they came across several interesting discoveries. First, they learned that Pauline had taken her daughter out of school nearly a month earlier without placing her in a new one. Next, not even a single witness had reported seeing Christina or her mother at the flea market whatsoever. And finally, nobody claimed to have seen Christina alive in several weeks. But even though these so-called coincidences were pretty weird, the authorities still didn't have any concrete evidence that could link the Ziles to the disappearance of their daughter. Therefore, the investigation continued. Meanwhile, in the days following Pauline Ziles' Crocodile Tears television appearance, the case of Christina Holt's disappearance received a lot of attention from the media and public. Pretty soon, Christina's face was plastered everywhere you could possibly think of. On TV, billboards, milk cartons, and at one point, the Adam Walsh Center, known for helping parents to find missing children, even became involved and helped to post over 10,000 flyers in Southern Florida alone. In addition, Pauline and John Zyle, along with Christina's biological father, Frank Holt, all taped separate interviews for the America's Most Wanted TV show. Eventually, in late October, the investigation and search by police became pretty heated. The authorities were getting increasingly suspicious of the Ziles. Various times when they tried interviewing the couple and set up appointments, Pauline and John plainly decided just to not show up. And overall, it seemed like they were doing whatever they could to avoid the police. At one point, when Christina was falsely reported to be found, neither Pauline or John went up to the police department to confirm or deny the report. And by now, they had completely fled to go live with Pauline's mother, Paula. Also, according to one of John's co-workers, he apparently demonstrated very little signs of emotion or stress despite his stepdaughter being missing. Eventually, after a short period of time, the investigation reached a breaking point and the authorities received a warrant to search the Zyle's apartment. While there, they found a tremendous amount of blood on various different surfaces. This included a pair of Christina's jeans, the walls, her bed, and the floor. Afterwards, they then checked out the interior of the Zyle's car, and here too, they found blood in the trunk and on some knives in a toolbox. Meanwhile, as all of this was being discovered, Pauline and John had decided that they were going to try and take the easy way out. 
The time period was now late October of 1994, and the couple had driven up to an orange grove and attempted asphyxiation in their white Cadillac. However, in a twist of fate, these lame efforts failed miserably. Soon, they were interrogated by police and both subjected to taking polygraph tests. After failing these two, Pauline quickly came clean about her husband being responsible for the murder of Christina, in return for a limited immunity. Then, when John Zyle was informed of her confession, he too admitted to him being the one responsible for Christina's death, and right away, he led authorities to the location of her body. When they found it, Christina's body had been buried in a vacant lot near a shopping center in Tequesta, Florida. Pretty soon, John was then arrested and charged with murder, and before long, Pauline was found to have been implicated as well with her attempts to cover up, condone, and facilitate the murder of her daughter. When authorities finally pieced together what had happened the night of Christina's murder, the sequence of events was as follows. And just a warning, it's pretty sad. So around midnight of September 16th of 1994, Pauline, John, and the family were all together in their one-bedroom apartment in Rivera Beach when John made Christina so terrified that she defecated on the floor in fear of her stepfather. Afterwards, John shouted at Christina asking, why did you put on the floor in front of me? Then there was a bunch of screaming and shouting coming from Christina and her mother, and evidently these were the responses to John beating his stepdaughter over and over again. Now, while Pauline never tried to intervene or physically stop John from doing this, according to a neighbor, at one point she did shout, John, that's enough. But by then, it was already too late. John had already taken Christina's life in an unspeakably brutal manner. And although there was an effort by him to revive her through CPR and placing her in a tub of cold water afterwards, by that point, she was too far gone. So following the death of their daughter, John and Pauline then kept Christina's body in a closet for a few days before eventually taking it, putting it in the car, and driving up to a vacant lot to bury it. After that, the two of them concocted a devious plan to cover all of this up. And that's everything that happened in a nutshell. But after a long and arduous process for the family members of Christina, both of them were sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. During this time period, the 24-year-old Pauline was actually eight months pregnant and ended up giving birth while incarcerated. However, this child was later given up for adoption. And all in all, this case is a terrible tragedy. I hope that Christina Holt is resting peacefully. What her parents did to her was really dehumanizing, and it's extremely tough to know that there are people like that out there. But fortunately, the two of them are now rotting in jail, so at the very least, that's two less deviant scumbags to have to worry about. But anyways, thank you for watching this episode of High Time Crime. If true crime is your thing, then please subscribe and hit the like button because that's all we do. I also have a second account with my brother named Horrifying where we tell stories about everything paranormal. This includes true crime mysteries, and things that are just downright spooky. I'd greatly appreciate if you subscribe to that too. I hope you have a great rest of your day. Take care, friend.